Once again today we're greeting you in the name of Jesus Christ, our wonderful Lord and Savior. Good to see you here in the auditorium of Northside Baptist Church today. In spite of the winter weather we've been having and the change of time, we're just glad to see you here. May God bless you. We welcome every one of you. We welcome you that are visiting with us, of course. And you that's listening out in the radio listening audience, we most certainly appreciate you tuning in to the Northside Baptist Church Hour that's coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church here in Athens. And this is Preacher Edward speaking. We're hoping during this hour coming up we can be a real inspiration. And you in the radio listening audience, you do someone a friend. If you get on your phone and call them to have them and tune in and get this hour coming up. I trust you do that. Now the message today and the singing will be on tape number 274. Tape number 274. If you're interested in these tapes, you write in and get them by name or by number. I'm bringing message number 13 on the book of Ruth today, which has to do with Naomi, a type of Israel. I want you to turn to the book of Ruth chapter 1. The book of Ruth chapter 1 for the scripture reading today, page 315 in my Bible. Now, if you're not getting the daily broadcast, you need to tune in to this station while you're now listening. And you can get the broadcast each day from 12, uh, 12 noon, Monday through Saturday. I'd like to read here a portion of a letter I received this past week from... Uh, uh, Ronald Stanley from uh, uh, Lithonia, Lithonia, Georgia. And I'm sure he wouldn't mind me reading a paragraph or two from a letter that he wrote me that I know you might be interested in it. I'll just read a couple of paragraphs. and I quote, Dear Reverend Edwards, I am a male, 30 years of age. I would like to thank you for helping to change my life. I listen to you every day while on my lunch hour. I pray to that God that somehow I may be able to come to Athens and meet you. I thank God that we have, thank God that we have men like you that preach the true word of God. I hope and pray that he will let me grow in wisdom that I might be a better, better able to worship him. I pray every night and morning that he will bless my family and I. And when I listen to you on the radio, I feel so good afterwards. I go with a smile on my face the rest of the day. For I know that I have the love of God in me. I hope that you will pray for me, and my family, that we might get closer to God. I pray that God will bless you and give you the blessings that you so deserve. I hope and pray you'll be able to stay on the radio for many years to come. For it's such a great blessing to hear you preach the word of God, end quote. Now, let us like that encourage you to keep on keeping on. You never know who's listening out there. And we do have a great, great number of people that listen to us at the lunch hours. We have people that are doing construction work, working on highways, uh, different places where they take their lunch and they just sit out in the truck and there they have the lunch and then they listen to our broadcast while they're having lunch. I have many, many people tell me they do that. And we appreciate the open door, uh, being able to get out the gospel and the closing days of this grace, grace age. There's never been a time when we need to try to get the word of God out as in this hour in which we live. Our sins on the abound, on the increase, just this past week, this uh, liberal group of judges and no doubt crooked lawyers involved overturned the conviction of this fellow Potts. Now Potts had been sentenced to death and rightly so. And he should have been put to death a long time ago, many years ago. Some of you remember his story how that he and a couple of women parked in front of a man's house and went up to the man's house and knocked on his door and told him he needed some help. The man happened to be a mechanic, young man, had a wife and two precious children. And he was the kind of man that would accommodate anybody. Big-hearted, give you the shirt off his back, 
And he didn't know this stranger Potts, this killer, this criminal, this murderer. And uh, Potts asked him, would he take him in the town, maybe in his car? I don't remember exactly how it went. But anyway, the young boy willing to accommodate this cold-blooded murderer, these two women he had with him, went down with them and probably got them in his automobile. Uh, and then they started down the highway, and then this fellow Potts pulled a gun. And he told this young man, I'm going to kill you. And the young man began to plead with him. He said, sir, I, I, I come to help you, and I'm wanting to help you. And said, I have two little children back home, and I love them, and they love me. And said, I said, I, I'd like to raise them. I'd like to see my children grow up. Pot said, buddy, you'll never raise your children. They'll raise somebody else to raise them. And he pulled the trigger and shot the man in cold blood murder right there uh, in the car beside the road. Now that man was sentenced to die exactly like he should have been. Now you think about if that had been your son, uh, been you and you had to leave two little children and this murderer said, no, you're not going to raise your children. Somebody else will do that. Now, what do you think ought to be done to him? You're, well, I know what should have been done to him. Exactly what God said in this Bible. He should have been put to death. Should have been in an electric chair. Put in an electric chair in just a matter of weeks after this happened. Now, these liberal, crime-loving, venal, crooked judges and some lawyers that's overturning these cases of, of the death penalty have absolutely turned this case, overturned this case. So now he's like the group that killed the all day family. Now they're going to have to go all through all the trial again. And it's going to cost you a lot of money, tax money. Now there's something bad, bad wrong with our judicial system. We got a bunch of low down crooks in position that's making these overturns and turning these criminals loose. And it seems to me like that our senators, our congressmen, our governor, and somebody in authority could do something about it. Now, the people in the state of Georgia are sick and tired of it. These liberals, these infidels that had the beginning back when Earl Warren was head of the Supreme Court, a rank liberal, and changed the system. And from that time until now, they have been filling the land with criminals. Man can go out here and commit murder, kill a half a dozen one concurrently. In other words, we just let him serve all seven of them at one time. And then he goes out there and he stays in prison a few years. And then they turn him loose. He's on the street again. Now this thing of serving a sinner concurrently, it's, it's not right. It's not good sense. It's one of the faults in our judicial system. You can't serve two sinners at the same time. You got to serve one consecutively after the other. And this thing they call a life sentence is a joke and a laughing stock to the world. Get up there and say, we're going to sentence this man to life. And over America, there's a proven fact that all people that's been sentenced to life in America for cold-blooded murder have, have uh, been out of prison on the average of, of building some three to five years. And when they commit cold-blooded murder, they build from three to five years. They call it a life sentence. What a joke. Beloved, there's something wrong. Our judicial system is rotten. It's rotten to the core, and we need some judges, and we need some lawyers, we need some men, we need some people with backbone, we need some people that's got guts enough to do something about it. And our leaders ought to do that. We vote them in, put them in position. They sit around, draw their breath and their sour, and fuss and quarrel with the other party. And things like this are eating us up here in Georgia. And criminals are being turned loose all over this nation and they retrying these fellows and burning up your tax money. And it's all uncalled for. And beloved, these, um, these appeal court judges, 
of this leaven circuit or whatever, whichever one it is, I hope I have it right. Those birds, I'm telling you, if they are sensible judges, I wouldn't want them to judge my bird dog. I'll be honest with you. That is a pathetic group. They love that criminal. That's the way they made the money, trying criminals. Many judges love those criminals. They kill them about the victim of his family. They love the criminal. That's why they get the red water. These, some of these crooked lawyers, the land's being filled with lawyers today. It's overloaded with lawyers. They're trying to make a showing, and they love lawbreakers. Man, if they can get somebody to break the law, they might have a chance to make a little money. They love these lawbreakers, these criminals. And that's the reason we're in the mess we're in today. Now, don't misunderstand me. We have some good judges. we got some good judges here in Athens. You have other good judges, honest judges, some Christian judges. And you have some good lawyers, Christian lawyers that will do right. But you got some so crooked they have to screw their britches on when they get up every morning. You could drag them through a barrel of fish hooks and they never get stuck by one. But we have some good ones that I'm glad we do have. And I admire them and appreciate them. I'm behind them. But if something's not done about the overturning of the death penalty, which God put in the book and said should be done, they should be put to death. And if something's not done about these liberals and infidels and brainwashed liberals, beloved, they're going to continue to fill this land with cold-blooded murders going to kill your young ones and they're going to kill your grandchildren and they're going to kill you and rob you and if it continues on it's going to be to the place where every man will have to walk down the street with a gun in his hand on his hip even to protect himself and his family just a while back uh, uh, five little boys went up to a store and stole some stuff then decided they wanted to rob somebody that was a little boy, about 15 years old. He'd been working at the church on the way home. They were going to rob him. And, of course, he didn't want to give up his money. So you know what they did? Killed him. Shot him in the back. Killed him like a dog. He bled to death in the street. What did he do with those fellows? One of them got sentenced for it. One of them got a life sentence for it. And then, of course, they added on to that a few more years for robbery. And then that runs concurrently. That boy will be out in the matter of just a very few years. Now that's pitiful. That's sad. That's a shame. And something ought to be done about it. And I'm going to speak out against it whether people like it or not. I know what this book teaches. And I got loved ones I want to see spared and not killed by these criminals. And I'm going to take my stand against it. And I want everybody to know that and you want me to tell you more about it, talk to me personally. I'd be glad to tell you a little more about it personally than I could on the air. In the book of Ruth, we find in verse 1, Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. And the name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi, and the name of his two sons, Marlon and Kilion, Bethlehemites of Bethlehem, Judea, Judah, and they came into the country of Moab and continued there. Now, I want to deal with this woman, Naomi. Naomi is a type of the nation of Israel. Now, we saw her as the wife of Elimelech. We saw her as the mother of Kilion and uh, the, the other boy, Marlon. And we saw her, of course, the grandmother of a little boy named um, Obed. And so she became a, a great mother in Israel, but she was a type of the nation of Israel. And I'm going to show you how she was a type of the nation of Israel. I was in Israel just a few weeks ago, and the guide told us that they had some uh, 4 million Jews now in Israel and 2 million Arabs. And those Jews are coming in from all over the world. I understand Russia is letting uh, a few more go in. And they're going in. And they're going in because God said they would. Now if you want to know what time it is, uh, prophetically speaking, 
You take a look at that Jew. He'll tell you exactly what time it is. Just watch it. That Jew is one of the most peculiar men in the world today. That Jew can travel all over the world and he'll still be a Jew, whether he be in China, Taiwan, England, America, Russia, or whatnot. He's still a Jew. He maintains his identity and his nationality. In that respect, he's a Jew. Send him up yonder to Eskimo land and he will uh, go up there and, and uh, take all the disease that they have and and outlive every one of them. Beloved, he, he's able to stand God. God stands, hold, God keeps him is what I'm trying to say. He's preserved. Maybe I better clear that statement up. He can go up there and escape taking the disease, get the money and still outlive the Eskimos. That's something, isn't it? You'd meet him in Shanghai, he's still a Jew. You'd meet him down in South America, he's a Jew. Now God Almighty started him out as a Jew, a person, a Hebrew, Israelite, and then he's called a Jew. They are God's peculiar people, never been a race of people on the earth just like them, and never will be. God Almighty made them a peculiar race of people, starting out with Abraham, call them Hebrew, later through Jacob, called Israel, later through Judah, called the Jews. And now they are called Hebrews, they are called Israelites, they are called Jews, and that's synonymous. Whenever you mention one name, that covers all of them. And they're very peculiar. They're some of the smartest people in the world. Some of the greatest inventions that have been made in the medical field or the field of science or any field has been done by a Jew. If you don't believe it, you check out. Now they are peculiar people. You can bring... Uh, Germans over here in America, it won't be long until they'll amalgamate, they'll blend in with the other American people here in the, Amer the melting pot. You can bring the Japs in, you can bring the far Asians in here, they do likewise. But you bring that Jew in here and he'll be a Jew as long as he's here until he dies. God made him like that. Now, Naomi here is a type of that Jewish nation. Now, God said you stand by that nation. I do know that the nation's been hated, the Jews been hated like no other race of people on the face of the earth. Now, there's a reason for that. Before I go further along, let me give you part of the reason. Reason number one, when they crucified Jesus, they said, let his blood be upon us and upon our children. They rejected their Messiah. God didn't forget that. But the reason they're so hated and despised and killed and slaughtered. And Adolf Hitler killed six million. Russia killed millions of them. There were millions of them killed in Italy. They have been killed all over the world. Slaughtered by the millions. Mistreated. Whipped. Starved. And burned in ovens. And treated worse than dogs. Now why did that happen? Why did that happen? Well, that happened because God Almighty said it would. God said to those people, he said, now I'm going to use you to speak to the world. God dealt in generalities until Abraham came along. He dealt with human race in general. When Abraham came along through the sovereign act of God, God chose him and said, I'm going to select a nation. And out of this nation, I'm going to produce prophets. Out of this nation, I'm going to give my word. Out of this nation, I'm going to give the Bible. Out of this nation, I'm going to give my son the Messiah. And God, through the Jewish nation, did exactly that. And the devil hates the Jewish people. He hates them with a passion. There's two groups of people the devil hates in the world more than any other. One is that wandering Jew. The other is God's true believers. They're hated by the devil. And the devil hates the Jew because from the Jew came salvation. From the Jew came the word of God. From the Jew came the Savior. And that's exactly why they're persecuted 
They're beaten. Why did Hitler kill six million of them, put them in gas chambers and so forth? Why? Just what I said. Because the word of God came from them. The Messiah came from them. And uh, God used them to speak to the nations. Why did Russia persecute them and persecuting them now? For the same reason. Why did they drive them out of Italy many years ago? For the same reason. Why did they drive them out of England at one time? For the same reason. Why have they been driven all over the world and called the one Jew? The same reason. It's because God chose that Jew and through that Jew he gave the Bible the greatest book in all the world and through that Jew he gave the prophets and the men of God through that Jew came Jesus Christ the Messiah and that's why they've been hated and they will be hated now Naomi left Bethlehem God told these Jews said you go down Lived there in the promised land. And Bethlehem was part of the promised land. You stay there. When you get into trouble. You get on your face and pray toward Jerusalem. And I'll take care of you and feed you. We find that she and her husband became discouraged. Went down to Moab. And so there she left. Her God given land. And was scattered there. Among the Moabitish people. Now God said. In Leviticus chapter 26 and verse 33. I will scatter you among the heathen. And draw out a sword after you. In Leviticus 26, verse 18, I'll punish you seven times more for your sins. Now, as long as Israel did what God wanted them to do, God blessed the land, gave them food, gave them the right kind of weather, clothed them, took care of them. But when they disobeyed God, God said, I'll allow you to be kept, kept, kept by your enemy. And they captured them. We find that Nebuchadnezzar out of Babylon captured them in Canada, Babylon for 70 years. And then we find later on, they were dispersed whenever we find Titus, the Roman general, came in and destroyed the temple in Jerusalem, 70 AD, and scattered the Jews over the known world. Now God said, I will scatter you because of your disobedience. They began to live like the heathen, the people around them. God said, don't do it. They began to marry among the heathen. God said, don't do it. God said, you disobey my laws and my ordinances, and I'll deal with you seven times. God said, I'll scatter you over the world. That God did. And that's why no race of people on the face of God's earth has ever suffered like the Jewish race. They disobeyed God. Now God had to chastise them. Now when Naomi went down into Moab, she was chastised. She went down and she had four in her family. She and her husband and two sons. Down in Moab, she buried her husband. She buried Marlon and she buried Kilion. And she was cut to a fourth. And that's what happened to the nation of Israel. When Titus came in and destroyed Jerusalem, there he cut the nation of Israel to a fourth when they were scattered Around the known world at that time. Just like God said. They were cut to a fourth. Now in the number of years they tarried there in Moab. The Bible said they took wives. But they bore no children. They stayed there some nine or ten years. But they didn't have any children. And that plagued them. For a Hebrew woman. Or a Hebrew man. Not to have a male child. By his wife. Was somewhat of a disgrace. And these two Moabitess girls did not produce children for Marlon and Kilion. And that hurt. That was a chastisement. And finally, Naomi took as much as she could. And she said to these daughter-in-laws, we buried my husband, we buried your husbands. And I'm going back home. Somebody said that God's blessing up there in Bethlehem. And I want to go back. And she decided to go back. And then she came back out of Moab. Now God said in the end time, the Jews will come back to the Jewish homeland. Naomi here is a type of the Jews going back home. And they're going back home now. On May the 14th, 1940, at 5 o'clock in the afternoon, they raised the flag of David. And for the first time in 2,500 years, the nation of Israel became another nation. And Jesus said, learn a parable of the fig tree when his branches yet tend and put forth legion no summer's nigh. 
And that was the beginning of the budding of the fig tree on May the 14th, 1948, when she was recognized as a nation. She's had to fight to hold that little territory, but she's holding it, and these Jews are coming in there from other places in the world. And so Naomi goes back to Bethlehem. That's a type of the Jew coming back home in the end time. But when she went back to Bethlehem, she didn't go alone. She brought with her a Gentile bride by the name of Ruth. And so when the church goes back in the end time, back to the old Jewish homeland, where she's going now, she's going to bring, as it were, Ruth with her, which is the church. That is, the church is being formed and called out by the Holy Spirit as Israel begins now to go back home. And in the end time, the church will be completed and we'll be caught out to meet Jesus in there and the Jew will be at home. So when Naomi went back to Bethlehem, Judah, she carried with her Ruth, which is the type of the church. And that Jew has played a major part in the church and church has made, played a major part and trying to help the Jew over the years. And then number six, she had a, a kinsman there in Palestine. And we saw something about him. The Bible says in chapter 2 and verse 1, And Naomi had a kinsman of her husband, a mighty man of wealth of the family of Elimelech, and his name was Boaz. A rich man, a wealthy man, owned some land, able to buy other land. And he lived there in Bethlehem. And when she goes back and Ruth, the church, goes back with her. And then here comes Boaz, which is a type of Jesus Christ. Now Naomi going back and Boaz coming on the scene is a type of our Lord Jesus Christ coming back down to the earth to set up his kingdom on the earth and reign from Jerusalem. Boaz is that type. And so she goes back and now comes Boaz. Now the Messiah has not come as far as they're concerned. But he has come. And Naomi goes back not realizing what Boaz would do. And when she goes back she finds something wonderful. Now the Jews today are going back to the Jewish homeland. They're going back in blindness. They're going back in unbelief. And when they get there, they have, have don't know exactly what's going to happen there, but sooner or later after they get there, they're going to find their Boaz. Because their Boaz is Jesus. He's coming back to set up the kingdom. Now where Naomi was when she went back into Bethlehem, Judah, when the people came out to meet her and she said, Is this Naomi? She said, Don't call me Naomi. Call me Merah. I went away full. I've come back empty. God has dealt bitterly with me. That's exactly what's happened to the Jewish race. As they go back, they can turn and look back how they've been dealt bitterly with in the earth uh, since the days of the dispersion. And so she said, don't call me Naomi anymore. Just call me Merah. I've gone through a period of bitterness and there's no human race on the earth today, world over, I'm speaking, that's gone through an era of bitterness like that poor Jew. And as they go back to the Jewish homeland today, they're walking down the street where Naomi walked, and the people are watching them as they come in. And she said, they said, is this Naomi? And I've seen them stand there in that Tel Aviv airport in Israel. Those planes that come in there, now I've seen those Jews jumping up and shouting, clapping their hands when they saw some of their loved ones coming in from Russia, coming in from America, or some other place, coming back home. Oh, they said, is this Naomi? They said, we have been scattered, but thank God we're coming back home. And so they're coming back home. And where Naomi was at that time is where the Jews are right this very minute. They're in the land of uh, uh, Israel. And so she had a near kinsman, and that near kinsman, of course, was Boaz. And whenever Israel gets back to the land, there'll be a remnant there. There'll be a remnant. The remnant is already there. All the Jews from all over the world will not go back until Jesus comes to set up his kingdom. 
Now, when Jesus comes to set up his kingdom, he's going to hiss for him. And whenever he hisses for him, all the Jews from all over the world, wherever they are, will go back. But there'll be only a remnant to go back. And 144,000 of them will evangelize during the tribulation period. And that remnant is already there. And they'll be ministering during the tribulation period. And at the end of the tribulation period, God's going to hiss for the rest of them. And they're coming out from every part of the earth as fast as they can get to Jerusalem. And when they get to Jerusalem, they're going to see their Messiah. They'll see their great Boaz. And the Bible said they will look at him and they will say, where did you get those wounds in your hands and in your feet? You'll find that in uh, Zechariah chapter 13, verse 6. And one shall say unto him, what are these wounds in thine hands? Then he shall answer those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. So when God hisses for the Israelites, they go back. And then Jesus stands before them and he begins to speak to them and they'll say, where'd you get those wounds in your hand? Where'd you get the wounds in your feet? See, they know the Old Testament scriptures to the extent that that must be done. And uh, uh, now they realize it, but uh, they, they missed him when he came the first time. And he said, well, he tells you here, I received them. In the house of my friends. And when Jesus reveals himself. As the real true Messiah. Like Joseph revealed himself to his brethren. When he came down to Egypt for corn. He went in and wept bitterly. And he went out and said. I am Joseph. I can help you. And so Jesus Christ. When he comes back to set up his kingdom. In Jerusalem. Then those Jews will turn to him. And whenever they see that he is the Messiah and they have missed him and they crucified him 2,000 years ago, the word of God said then they're going to weep and wail. They are mourn. You never heard such mourning in your life that you're going to hear in Jerusalem whenever they realize they crucified their Messiah 2,000 years ago. And then they're going to realize why they have suffered for 2,000 years. Like some time ago and going up the upper room. There's a little uh, harp out there. And a group of young men dancing. I said to the guide as they danced around. I said what are they saying? He said they're dancing and they're saying this. Glory, glory, hallelujah. The Messiah cometh from the east. Glory, glory, hallelujah. The Messiah cometh from the east. And they're still looking for that Messiah to come from the east. And he's coming. Naomi went back. She met Boaz. He's a type of that Messiah. He's a type of Jesus Christ. And there he took Ruth. He married her. And she's a type of the church. And then Naomi received great blessings. And that's exactly what's going to happen in the end time. When Ruth the church is going to meet Jesus in the air. And then the Jews will come back to the Jerusalem. And then they'll recognize the Savior. And then they'll realize what the church has meant to them. And the church will realize what the Jew has meant to them. These things are fast shaping up. They're dull tailing. They're, they're shaping up very fastly. And the end time is near. And God said when that Jew starts going back to the, Jew, the Holy Lamb. Matthew 24, verse 32. When you see these things, he said, lift up your head. Your redemption draws nigh. And one of the greatest signs in the world today is the Jew sign. If you want to know what time it is, you watch that Jew and you find out exactly what time it is. It's later than you think. It's past the 11 o'clock hour and they're going back and then their Boaz is coming. But before their Boaz comes, our Boaz is going to take us to meet him in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Naomi, a beautiful type of Israel. I hope I present it to the extent that you can break it down, cogitate up on it, let it become part of you and be a blessing to you as you sojourn. Let's stand to our feet. 
Dear Heavenly Father, in the precious name of Jesus, we see these wonderful truths in the word of God and we see the movement of the Jew and we see world situations shaping up and wicked becoming more wickedly, more crime and more evil in the land. God, we know time is drawing nigh when you're going to bring your Ruth to meet you in the air. God, help us to be faithful. and Look to thee. Get all the people we can in before it's too late. In Christ's name, amen. While well, Debbie plays, listen to me. Are you here unsaved? Are you here backslidden? Are you here wanting to join the church? Are you here for any other reason you want to come forward on? Debbie, play a stanza. So if you're here, I want you to come. If you want to respond to the invitation, you just come right on. We'll help you. Get saved, come back to God, He dedicate your life. 